Welcome to the second tutorial video for the iTensor library. This lesson has companion code that you can find under the main directory of the iTensor library under the folder tutorial and then 01 underscore 1. This lesson is the first one to actually show iTensor code and as a central example we'll consider a single site wave function for a single spin half. So this wave function is defined on a single lattice site which you can think of as having two discrete states labeled one or two or up and down. Now the most general wave function that one can write for this single spin half degree of freedom is simply a wave function that's a linear com any linear combination of these two single site states. So this linear combination means that we have two complex numbers which we call here psi sub s and the s runs from one to two. And in a slight abusive notation, we may either call this linear combination of these basis states, the wave function, psi as a ket, or we could just refer to psi sub s, which is a, vector, a complex vector with two elements. We could call that the wave function. Now, in the tensor diagram notation introduced in the previous tutorial, this wave function or wave fun set of wave function amplitudes is just a single tensor with one um, line coming out and that line can again take two values. So now we'll see our first example of iTensor code. So the, actually before we introduce the iTensor, in C++ you have to declare an um, index object that, that, that defines this iTensor. So we make this index object by making a new object of type index with a capital I and we give its constructor two arguments. The first is a string, s, and really this string is up to us, so s is just a, a choice here, and it's simply just the name of the index when we print it. So it's really something for humans to see to understand which indices an iTensor has. So really we could have called this s1, or we could have called it t, doesn't matter. And then the second argument to the constructor is very important, and it's actually the range of the index, or you could call it the dimension of the index. And this is a, something that we fix when we construct the index and it can't be changed afterward. So this really defines this index once and for all. So once we have this index, we can plug it in now to the iTensor constructor and that will create a new iTensor. Here we've bound it to the variable psi. And this iTensor will have this one index s, so it'll be a rank one or order one iTensor. And all of its components will be default initialized to zero just for convenience. So now we can initialize its components to make it into a more interesting tensor. So the way to do this is, again, we've shown the code declaring the index and declaring our i tensor, and then we plug the tensor, we, sorry, we plug the index into the i tensor, and then into the index we plug the number one. And so what this does is it creates a temporary object, s of one, which um, encapsulates the idea of setting this index to the value, to its first value. And so we temporarily think of setting s to 1, plugging that into psi to access the first component of psi, and then setting that first component to 1. So again, s of 1 means s set to the value 1, plug that into psi to access its first component, and set that to 1. Then, there, for convenience, there's a macro defined in the library called print dat, which is short for print the data in the tensor. So if we call that macro on psi, it prints information about psi and also all of its non-zero components. So here we see that psi is a rank one tensor which, with one index, which is s. There's the name that we gave it. Um, some more information about s, which we could describe in a later tutorial, and its dimension. And then importantly, we see its first component. So the one here means that it's the component where s is set to one, and its value, which is the one that we chose to set. So as a spin wave function, this is a single spin pointing in the up direction. To do more interesting things with our wave function, we need to make some operators. So to do this, we just declare two more i tensors that are going to become the operators SZ and SX. So of course, since they're operators, they're like matrices and they have to have two indices. Now our convention in the library is to make these two indices to be well, one of them has to be the site index so that we can act on our site. And then our convention is to make the other one the prime of the site index. 
Okay, so what is the meaning of this primed function? Well, we could have just used two different indices. We could have made a new index, say, called t, that had the same size as s, so that we get a 2 by 2 matrix for s, z, and s, x. And that would have been fine, but an easier convention is to use s both as the row and the column indices, if you will, for these matrices. And the reason for that is because we can apply this matrix to our site, and then the result still has the index s just with a prime on it, and then we can conveniently remove the prime later. So the function primed returns a copy of the index s, but now that copy will have a prime level of 1. So internally, in every copy of an index, there's an integer field that saves the prime level. And that prime level could, is default to 0, but it could be 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. In practice, you should only be working with prime levels that are, say, up to about 4. If you find yourselves working with prime levels that are getting much higher, then you might not be using the prime level system the way it was intended. So now we've declared two iTensors that are going to be our operators, and we need to set their components to the right values to really represent the SZ and the XX operators. So an easy way to do this would be to actually write out the matrices, but of course C++ doesn't support really writing matrices. So to come as close as we can, iTensor supports the notation where we say comment in it, we provide our tensor to be initialized, we give the order of the indices that we want the values on the right to correspond to. So we put the S first, meaning it's gonna be the row index, and we put prime to S second, which means it's gonna be the column index. And then we just write the values out the way we would normally for, for a matrix. Now, I've, here I formatted it in a square, but notice it's really just a list of numbers separated by commas and terminated with a semicolon. And then we can do something similar for SX. So now that we have our SX tensor, which is our SX operator, we can do something with it, which is we can act it on our wave function. So remember, our wave function tensor was set to just be a single spin pointing in the up direction. So how do we actually apply this tensor sx to our wave function? This is the main feature of the iTensor library. Actually, all we have to do is just multiply them together as if they were scalars. We simply just use the star operator, and that performs the right tensor contraction. Now, the reason the tensor contraction happens the right way is because we set everything up correctly to begin with. So we gave sx an s index that matches size s index. Those indices are compatible with the same index, and so the star operator will realize this and automatically contract them. The s prime index is different, it doesn't have any matching index on psi, so it will remain uncontracted. So internally a lot of work happens to figure this out, and then this contraction happens as shown in this diagram, and the result is again a rank one tensor as it should be, because an operator acting on a wave function is another wave function. And that, result, that resulting wave function will now have the index s prime, but that's fine, because s prime is really morally the same as s, just with an extra little decoration on it. Now what state do we get? Well, you can think about it for a minute. If you act sx on a wave function that's pointing up, sx only has off-diagonal elements, so it should flip it. So we can check this by saving the result of sx times psi, and then calling print dat on it, and seeing that, sure enough, now only the second component is non-zero. So the spin that was pointing up now is pointing down. Notice again also that it has the s prime index as we predicted from following the diagram. So now we can use this machinery to do a more interesting example, which is we could choose the initial angle of the spin to be theta equal to pi over four. Now to do this for a spin and a half, that means to set the components to the following values, the first component to cosine of theta over two, and the second component to sine of theta over two. Now the one halves are just a, pro a, a byproduct of the fact that this is a spin one half representation. So here we make a real number theta, pi over four, that's our angle. We access the first and second elements of psi and set them to the cosine and sine of that angle divided by two and print the result and we see that we get the appropriate answers, which you can check or normalize to one as a wave function should be. Now, um, an interesting thing to do would be to measure the SZ expectation value of our new wave function that's tilted at an angle. And um, diagrammatically, that looks like simply 
surrounding the SZ operator with the ket and bra version of psi. And you see that it has no, no external lines, so it's equal to a scalar. So for convenience, let's go ahead and prepare the bra version of psi, which um, anticipating our operator convention needs to have a primed S index, so we call primed on psi. So just as primed works on an index and adds a prime, primed acting on an I tensor primes all the indices of that I tensor and returns a copy of the new I tensor. And then we also call conj because a bra um, elements should be the complex conjugate of the corresponding cat. And we store the result, call it C psi for conjugate psi. And then finally, we use the convenience of I tensor contraction to calculate the following diagrams. We sandwich the operator SZ in between our bra and our cat and also SX. And to do this, since we, again, since we prepared everything ahead of time, we simply just star them all together. So we say C psi, star SZ, star psi, and we know, because we set it up correctly, that our diagram has no external lines, so it's equal to a scalar. Um, but of course, in C++, this will still be typed as a tensor. So to retrieve that single scalar component of it, we just take the resulting tensor and call dot to real on it, and that will return the real number that's the single element of this scalar tensor. And similarly for our SX expectation value. Now we get two different real numbers, ZZ and XX. And we can print the results. And we see, sure enough, that we get the same value for these two expectation values. And that makes sense because our spin was tilted at a 45 degree angle off the z-axis. So its projections onto the z and the x-axis ought to be the same. And we can check that they're properly, they're the proper size to describe a spin a half. So just to review how the automatic contraction in the iTensor library works, Let's take a closer look at the tensor contractions involved in computing the expectation values on the previous two slides. Instead of making the sandwich between the bra operator and ket right away, we can break it down into some smaller steps. So first of all, let's think about the right two, the right two um, factors in that product, which would be the SZ operator times psi. So recall that our SZ operator was created with two indices, S prime and S, and then our wave function psi had one index, S. So when we call the star operator between SZ and psi, it will automatically see that they have a matching index, S, and contract over this index. S prime will remain uncontracted because it doesn't match any other index on psi. So that will be the only remaining index. We can store that in a temporary called Z psi. Now, uh, we already prepared C psi, the conjugate of psi, to have an index S by calling primed as we made a copy. So now that's perfectly set up to match the primed S primed on Z psi. And we do, we do this contraction now separately. And S prime will be contracted. There are no other indices. So the remaining tensor, which we can store in a temporary here called expect, will simply be a scalar tensor. That's a tensor of rank zero, no indices. Finally, on such a tensor, we're allowed to call the method to real, which returns a real number that's equal to the single component of that scalar or rank zero tensor. So to review, the first step in creating I tensors is to create indices. Indices are constructed by giving them a name and a size. That size is immutable and set once and for all and defining that index but we can make any amount of copies of that index very cheaply, and we can even prime them. Once we have a set of indices, we can construct an I tensor of any rank by feeding those indices into the I tensor constructor. Then we can set the components of an I tensor by temporarily setting copies of our indices to various values. Here we set A to its second value, B to its first, C to its third. Again, C of three just makes a temporary object that represents the third setting of C. It doesn't leave C set to three, it's just a temporary thing. Plugging these into T, we access the two, one, three component of T and we can set that to five. And as we already saw, we can prime an index. We can use this to set up contractions ahead of time and then use the star operator to automatically contract matching index pairs. Finally, to test your understanding of this tutorial, let's look at some tensor products and think about applying the star operator between the two tensors and ask how many indices would remain.
in this product, the A indices on the left tensor and right tensor match, so those will be automatically contracted. The B indices also match, so they will be automatically contracted. But the B prime index doesn't match any other indices on the left tensor, so it will remain uncontracted. So the product of these two tensors will be a rank one tensor that will have an index B prime. In this example, the only index that matches is C from the left tensor with C on the right tensor. S primed S, B, and D will remain uncontracted, so the result will be a rank four tensor. Thanks for watching.